Hey, look at this. It's a room of beautiful women today. I'm digging it. We do. The men are taking care of the women in the, in the front, so that's good. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're kind of giving everybody a little bit more transition time. So if it's coming over or starting just a little later than you anticipated, it's just trying to give everybody the time to get from one room to the other. And to get a pretzel. And to get a pretzel. <laughs> Pretzels are important. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is introduce our friend, Anne. Anne Osborne. How many of you are familiar with Anne already? Oh, look at that. We got a fan club. <laughs> I love it. We really don't need to go over the, They heard it all yesterday. Okay. So we'll go ahead and just go ahead and get started with Anne's presentation then, and we'll get right to it. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry no problem. No, you're fine. It's good. <laughs> Morning. So um, I wanted, as you know, so the handout that you have is pretty much kind of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. There's about four outlines at, per table, and then we're going to do it at, at, we are going to do an activity at the other end, and it's much simpler. It's individually focused, so you're not going to have to move tables, all that stuff. And thank you so much for doing such a good job yesterday for moving. Sure. Okay, so the, the source of this presentation came out of relationships. Um, I would like to start with what's called the fourth remembrance. And basically what it says is, all that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. There is no way to escape being separated from them. And I was just talking a moment ago about how I've seen my personal relationships change, people that I really thought were committed and would stick around, and they've just kind of wandered away. And therapists, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what's my part, what's their part? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today, because I think it's really important that we not blame ourselves for what we, once again, cannot control. So OM's disruption, as we all know, is very traumatic. So what we're having is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. <clears throat> Friendships buffer much like family and care providers. They help with trust within ourselves and others and alleviate stress and provide a sense of connection and purpose. There are mirrors to know ourselves. As we look into someone else's face, we see how they're responding, and we look inside of ourselves, and it's actually technically called mirror neurons, but we won't go there. So Facebook is one level of intimacy, and what I'm hoping that we can gather in this conference is making new friends and new faces with those connections. The trigger for this talk, I went over yesterday about what happened to one friend of mine with the Stanford situation and realized that she needed a lot more support than was available to her, but she had to also understand what was reasonable. I was available at that time. That's right, I should say you weren't here yesterday. So <clears throat> what ended up happening very quickly, I'll, I'll do it in a gist. A friend of mine is part of a group that I had never met her and she and her husband went to Stanford four hours away. They tested for COVID before they went. Upon coming back at home, they tested again. Hubby came up positive. Patient friend came up negative. She had to leave the home because the germs were already there. She was sent to a hotel. Then she was sent to a neighbor's mother-in-law cottage. But she didn't have a car, no personal possessions, no dog. It was a nightmare. And everybody in our group was, it was June. Everybody, revenge travel, we all know about it. Everybody was on their way to somewhere else. And she was falling apart. And so I stepped in and I introduced myself, went and picked up meds. But I wanted to be able to clarify for our group, how do we prevent something like that happening so that we feel the support that is available, whether it's through Facebook or our personal relationships. And so the focus of the talk is about developing a tribe 
people who are there for us and that they've made a personal commitment on some level. And you're going to decide that yourself and in that exercise. So <clears throat> over today, overall, we'll start with contexts, characteristics of friends, containment, trauma, interventions, and finish with the activity. Societal context, there's a, we all know this in our group here, the focus is on youth-oriented culture. Ageism, we kind of disappear. And I see that a lot also in the doctor's offices. You know, our young doctors, who look like they're 12, are talking to us, and the nurses look like they're 12. And they're adorable, but I don't, I'm, I may be older, but I don't want to be treated like I'm my grandmother, because I'm not. So the individualism, the Western myth, creates isolation, and that is dangerous. We are seeing problems, well, you all know, you, some of you have come and told me about shootings that are happening, this sort of thing. That's caused a lot of time by isolation, but also Many of us isolate ourselves, and what I wrote years ago after Dr. D'Amato had done that longitudinal study that folks who are 65 and older, specifically men, tend to isolate more. We are the social faces that bring to the relationship. Our culture right now is focused in on problems with the economy, gas prices, infant formulas, housing, medicine shortages, homelessness, political participation, busy and overtaxed with violence and politics. And there's less community support. And so we want to be able to look and figure out where those gaps are for ourselves, which we will do in the activity, so that you can develop an ability to support those areas of our lives. Personal, being in need is often a lonely place feeling lost and abandoned, quotes from a friend of mine. Our assumptions and perceptions affect our relationships. When I walk into a situation, what I'm already carrying, if I think I'm feeling like nobody's really supporting me and I look out on people's faces, that's what I'm going to see in your face, whether you have it there or not, because that's the lens I'm looking at. And I read an article the other night, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting way to, so perception is kind of like, you know when we change our glasses and we put our sunglasses on, and then everything looks different? That's perception, that's how we're changing. So I need to be aware of what I'm bringing to the table when I'm in contact with my friends. Let's see, I have to check my assumptions versus what is actuality, am I really abandoned? Yes, I feel lonely. Is it time for me to reach out? Characteristics of friends. Who can face mortality? My own and theirs. And that's the stickler point. People that are leaving us oftentimes are not ready to be dealing with their own stuff. I was just recounting a moment ago, and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Um, my husband and I went to dinner um, with another couple that it's his best friends. And we all had dinner, everything was fine. They had their wine and whatever. And we all separated after the dinner and went to our respective cars. And I got in the car, closed the door, and I said, check, we won't see them for six months. Not because anything happened, but it's because of their aging too. And they're not wanting to see. They were so surprised when I walked in the door because they think I'm going to go, oh, you know, and I don't. So characteristics of our friends. Who can face the mortality? How much time and energy, the bandwidth, do I have for educating other people about, you know, maybe it's really not something between you and I. Maybe it's something about your own issues around your own um, mortality. I have to decide how much I have available in my bandwidth to teach and share and try to work past their own denial. It's not my place. I'm suggesting that we choose our tribe ahead of time and limit who can and cannot hear our fears. The capacity. Characteristics. Individuals may not have the ability to be present and walk with you 
or me, despite their intentions. Yeah, I'm seeing some head nodding. They may want to, but they feel afraid. And remember what I talked about yesterday about body memories that get locked up and it's outside of my thoughts or my feelings or my images? They may be carrying their own bottled up energy that they don't know what that's about. And they may not know how to access those feelings. So it, it isn't about us or you or me, but it does affect us. I don't like that I know more than likely we're not gonna see those friends, but I still have to accept it. So how, I also wanna know how have, how have my friends shown up in the past? If they have, how have they shown up and why would they show up now? Because my job for me, being the boss of my life, it's about making sure that I'm not setting myself up. As I progress in my own journey for probable Mets, it's me needing to be sure that I'm taking care of myself and not reaching out to somebody that's not going to be available. And I really got clear about who hasn't been there in the past, so why would I expect them or want them to be there now? If they show up, wow, that's great. So they may not have the experience or the awareness. They may not want to complicate their lives, taking time to get involved, the timing. This is an important issue, too. It's that I have to open up my own blinders to assess what they may actually be having going on in their lives, in their families, Some, a child with cancer, a, a child that is in trouble in juvenile hall. We were just talking about that a moment ago. Someone else will be there for them. It's not up to me. These are comments that have been friends that I talked about. I don't know what to do. I'm uncomfortable. Thoughts that another friend will handle it better. And I looked at her. I was so mad at her. And she said, well, I just don't know what to do. And I looked at her and I said, Google it. <laughs> and you know what? We got beyond the rupture. And we were able to work our way through because I know that she wants to be there, but her mind goes blank, like all of us do when we're put on the spot. So, second set of eyes. It's a phrase that my husband and I use a lot because one of us has lost something. But it's, I also want to use it here because second set of eyes is my ability to go to a friend and say, you know, this is what's going on, and Am I really kind of blowing this out of proportion? Am I not seeing something? We need those rational friends. That's the same one who didn't know how to be a little more supportive and warm. But I love her. I love her ability to be rational. And I want her to be able to say, you know, Anne, I think you're making this bigger than it is. And I'm like, oh, OK. Because I want to drop that anxiety. Choose the people who can face mortality and the knots of fear. I love that phrase. Our culture denies death at every turn. Cancer triggers another person's own issues, whether fear and the unexplored. Surrender into acceptance. I'm sure a lot of us recognize what surrendering means. Basically letting go of trying to control. It's a spiritual phrase that works well for me. That's why I, I wrote the remembrance at the very beginning of this is accepting what is and accepting where we are on the path allows me to get to the truth sooner with less suffering. Support. What support can look like, whether with words. These are quotes. I don't know what to say, but I'm here and will walk with you. I know how you, f I can't know how you feel, but it must be hard. I don't have words to say how much I care. You matter to me. I'll pray with you. Support and action. I, I assume that all of you know what caringbridge.org is. Yep. Is there anyone that doesn't know? It's OK. It's all right. So write out caringbridge.org and look I at have, it. I have a caring. I thought you were going to say, does anyone have one now? Oh, OK. Yeah, as long as everybody knows. Well, 
two things. One is after I finish the presentation, then we all can talk more at length about it, and I'm sure that you would like to be able to share some of the attributes. What some of my friends have done with Caring Bridge is be able to organize. I don't feel like I need this level of support at this time, but when things escalate, I, want, I need my husband to know that food is covered. My husband is a foodie, and it's all about food. I could say a lot of things, I won't. He's a doll and cooks very well, at, and I'm a vegetarian and he's not. So ace is to him. But what it does is it can organize who's available to sit with the person. You set it up on a schedule um, so that spouse can go out and go into nature or go to his own medical appointments or hers. Um, the pieces that were most important outside of meals and time spent and who can help with the kids and take them to the movies and that kind of stuff was um, the sage advice, which I'll run to that in the presentation, is to have someone appointed amongst your crew that will manage all of that for you so that you're not trying to do it. We want to, because what it does is it helps empower people who really want to help and they can't do the treatments for us, and they can't go to those appointments, and they can't, there's a lot of other things they can't do, because we got primary jobs. They can manage all the people wanting to help, and that turns out to be very important. And so I was grateful that I received that recommendation. So does that give you a gloss? Perfect. Um, don't be afraid of who's a friend who says, let me know if you need anything. I've said this in multiple other workshops, be ready to tell them specifically what you want. If you can't think of something, let me give you a call, or let me send you a text, or let me send you an email. Here's everything that you can pick from. What I will also say about the friend at Stanford, bless her heart, is um, she was very, very specific about her dietary needs, and I just couldn't go there. I'm a health nut myself, and I get all that dietary stuff, but that's not my long suit. My long suit is trimming bushes, because I was sharing earlier, I also became a master gardener right? I had, before I was diagnosed. So I offer to go over and trim people's bushes, keep the hedges back, and that does turn out to be important because her bushes are out of control. So do what makes you comfortable, because we want our friends to want to come back because they're in there for the long run. It's not a one-time shot. So they can make up a spa basket, they can make a food basket, whatever works for you. And if you don't want it, share. Give it to somebody else. Just don't, you know, maybe you want to tell them, maybe you don't. Um, Actions, booking a, a walk, sitting on a bench. I'm a walker, I do a lot of walking and so, at the early end of my um, diagnosis, at the very beginning, I walked every single day with a new person every single day, and I never talked about my stuff. I only wanted to hear about their stuff, because I just needed to calm down, because I didn't understand this whole big picture. Now, it's about me talking, and not about them going on and on about their stuff, unless I've already talked, and I'm in the place for it. But that's a reflection. What I'm doing here is saying that's a boundary that you get to name. If you're starting to feel tired, because when we are emotionally available to people, we're opening up ourselves and we're taxing our energy. And so it's very, very important for us to watch how our energy is going out. And a side note, um, one of the very big moments in my journey with my husband was that his mother died probably a year and a half after I was diagnosed. And we were making those three hour trips one way to UCSF every three months. Well, we were also closing up her house and her second place, you know, where she had lived. And my brother and sister-in-law did not get it that I, we were really taxed. And at one point, I was so exhausted. And driving away, I said, this will never happen again. I am 100% responsible for my body and what I'm doing with it. And 
you could take care of yourself. But what it did also was help my husband understand that I knew how to take care of myself. I knew how to call my lines and that it was important in our relationship that he accept that. Yes, we were able to work through it and talk about it and that was a good thing. So, uh, slide six. Boundaries and containment. Intention guides us. So the somatic word means it's about the body, emotional and trauma, boundaries and assessing, boundaries within self, limit frightening yourself. Okay, so how we do that, this is, um, I'm probably running ahead, but yesterday I spoke about really paying attention to what's going on in your body, that if you find yourself really tightening up in your neck, you know, outside of doing, you know, the I have to do regular neck exercises because that's where I carry my tension. I have to pay attention to dropping my shoulders. But a technique that I learned in grad school, actually, for cognitive behavioral therapy, which I didn't practice in my world, one of the best things I learned was limiting the amount of time that I, ha I will allow my fears and stories and whatever make up in my mind. So I will pick, like, 10 to 11 a.m. or 1 to 2 in the afternoon. And literally, if it's 7.30 and I've got little stories started, ah, it's not 10 o'clock, not ready, we're not gonna go there. I strongly believe in not conjecturing. I do not believe in it, I won't allow myself to go there because it's toxic. Well, I'm glad I don't have to worry about trying to prove that. So it does work. It's a great technique. Um, there's a lot of literature behind kind of narrowing that out. What you would do in that one hour, if it's not journaling, I used to be a journaler, I'm not a journaler. Drawing, um, making collages. If you, do, everybody know what a collage, how to make a collage? Anybody not know how to? I'm seeing all head nodding, okay, good. So, um, Drawing, painting, uh, just sitting. For me, I'd meditate, which is my long suit. It helps me a lot. I really want to talk to you guys one day on meditation. Um, okay, so walking carefully to allow the healing. Articulate what works or doesn't work for you. Firestorms, texting. We spend a lot of time, there, there seems to be all kinds of social rules about texting, and it turns out no little book has ever been written about it. And apparently, people have strong feelings. I, I had no idea. This is my rational friend that told me this. In her family, she's not allowed to text during the day to her spouse and her son because it takes them away from whatever it is that they're doing, and they believe that that's a boundary violation. And I asked my husband, and he was like, no, not, not for me, but it's their personal thing. But there's a thing called ghosting that also happens. And I had an experience with that during the summer from someone that I really thought would be there. And I waited for a couple of weeks at a time that I really, really needed that support. And finally, what I realized was something else was going on, wasn't about me, and so I wrote back in a text, be well, my friend. And what that did was it put me back in control of the situation. It helped me stop longing. That longing word was a really hard one for me to understand what it was. But what it also did was it left it on workable terms. It's not like cat fighting, you know, where you're going to go to the death. But it, what it did, so she en actually ended up sending a card to me. Um, we're still in the waiting room on that friendship. We'll see. I, I hope it'll work out, but we don't know. The friendship goes back to college days. So, um, but that's the point about waiting to understand that something's going on in other people's lives and keeping that separation there. So the feelings, um, can the other person listen? Listen, there's a lot of ways to listening and you're doing awesome job as listening for nodding your head, I see you tracking whether you're looking at me or watching someone else take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So it's the opportunity also to really focus on keeping the frontal lobes on. Now, I know you all have heard me talk about keeping the frontal lobes on. Thank you. <laughs> so remember back, whether you've read it in the book or it was a presentation that I've done in the past, but those of you who have not been there, there's a part of the brain, this is not part of my training here, that is not connected to the amygdala. And this is really important to understand. The amygdala is that little guy inside of our head that says, oh my God, there's a tiger in the room. Or there's someone doing something that's really scaring me. And we have to know how to be able to manage our anxiety. So remember the occipital lobes in the back part of the brain are the only part of the brain that is not connected to the amygdala. And what we do to pull that occipital lobes, if you find yourself starting to amp up, you can look at a pattern on the wall, you can look at, and you can count squares, because the occipital lobes are all about counting and organizing. And what that will do is automatically bring your frontal lobes back on, because in order to be able to count, you have to be able to think, right? And so that will calm you down. And then remember yesterday what I also said, remember, the toes, yes, and alternating. But I promise, because I've done this for so many years with firefighters and law enforcement, you got to practice it if you want it to work when you need it. So very quickly, it's scratch your toes, one foot, scratch your toes the other. It doesn't matter which side you start with, but you, I'm doing it right now, just so that you can get the frontal lobes to come online because when you're doing that, you're organizing, right? Okay, back on track here. Containment. On the body, what's happening? Am I having blurring effects? Excitement, anger, anxiety. Listen to the cadence of the voice. So the voice can, you know, if you find yourself like, talking really strongly, and it's like a little surprising to yourself, that's a clue, something's going on. If you're talking very rapidly, that's a clue. It's like, oh, you observe that about yourself and just kind of slow down, take a deep breath, because those little signals are telling you you're leaving the window of arousal. And so the sooner that you can pull it back, the less likely you are to amp up your anxiety. You're feeling your feet, your shoulders, your back is straight, and your head held high. What that's about is, remember yesterday what I talked about, about leaning over and pinching off the diaphragm? Then you're preventing the oxygen from going to the brain. If you're sitting, making sure that you swivel your hips to make sure that they're squared in the seat and your lower back is supported so that you can feel your body's energy and strength. Stay in touch, breathe deeply from the belly, speak your truth. Emotional contagion. Emotional contagion, um, it was kind of funny. I, I was like, should I really put that in? If I'm really anxious and I'm up here like shaky and you know, you will start to pick that up. That goes back to remember the mirror neurons. You will start to pick up that and you just go, why am I feeling this way? Oh yeah, it's because the other person. So, that's how we relate to each other. I was at a, a meeting that was at my house the other day, and this woman who sat directly contiguous to me was having almost a literal anxiety attack as she was sitting there with me. She was trying to squash it down, and I'm like, slow down, take a deep breath, you're gonna be okay. I am gonna talk to her about that. Um, grounding. Keeping the frontal lobes online. Uh, I, as a therapist, would, would use a glass of water on a regular basis. You all know this trick. You, you start to amp up. You drink a little bit of water. You feel that temperature of the water in your mouth. You can also feel the wetness. That brings you back inside your body, less up in the head. I, I can tell you honestly, I spent decades in my head nothing was going on in the body. And I really thought, honestly, that I was really in tune with my body because I was a long distance runner, I was a heavy duty bicyclist, I worked out every day, 
I wasn't in touch with my body at all. So uh, standing up changes the blood pressure. If you have blood pressure problems, don't just stand up right away because we know what happens. We don't want you going that way. But I have a deal with myself that when my doctor comes into the room to give me the news of whatever the scan is, I stand up. Because what it does is it gives me more oxygen in my brain for me to stay in the room. I'm not dissociating, which I have a tendency to do because I don't like the news. So walking, you know, feeling your feet on the ground, feeling the containment, they call that grounding. Moving away from grounding and introducing it to checking in with yourself. Any pictures, you know, I said this yesterday, pictures in your mind, images, thoughts, colors, art journaling, working with the mind and the thoughts. Ram Das used to say, invite the feelings to come to tea so that you can have a conversation. What is it I'm really afraid of? What is it I really need? And remember the exercise, which I'll repeat because it's really good. Remember I spoke yesterday about getting your phone out and you've got to really do it. You've got to, I have a personal issue that I've really got to face something that I really don't want to face. You get this camera out, um, make sure that it's shoulder above with the face and you tell the camera everything you want to say about it. This is Sandra Parker. She just put out a book called Unease. And then you play it back, and you actually watch in the camera the muscles that are tightening up, whether it's the jaw, the throat, that, you know, some people have anxiety where it feels like they're closing up. Um, you're also doing kind of a mirror exercise yourself right there, because you're actually literally being frankly honest. And that makes it easier for you to then go to someone else and share what you need to say. So... All right, um, I've already gone over worst case scenarios, don't go there. Uh, little techniques that other people use is writing out your worst fears. We did this yesterday already, but writing out your worst fears and then burning them. Um, it's, it is a type of ritual, and so there's kind of more of a weight to it to actually do it. It gets it outside of your head. Thank you. Um, reach out. Please reach out if you're overwhelmed. Do not be alone. Use Facebook. Call someone. Call all those 800 numbers or whatever that number is now that we're using. Do you know what that number is? It's that one. You know, it, is it not? Is, you, yeah. 899? Well, don't call it. <laughs> don't call it right now. But yeah. Call, just don't be by yourself. Because what happens when we're by ourselves is that our little world gets smaller and smaller and it gets dangerous in there. It's not good to be up there in the attic. Gets, so what also you're doing with this is getting some distance about being able to name those feelings and getting some uh, distance from the thoughts and the feelings. Oh, it's, I, I just looked it up, it's 988. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 988. Suicide Perfect. And you know what? You don't have to be suicidal to call them. You know, it's, it's, they just want to help. I did a lot. I did thousands of hours of hotline work. So trauma. One of the physicians that, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, cortisol thermostat is always on. And that's the truth. So what that means is if you... Anybody who has a trauma background of unresolved feelings, like I talked about yesterday, every time something happens, you get this shoot of adrenaline. Well, this is why I want to talk to you about meditation. I noticed a couple of months ago, I don't get that shoot anymore. And why, I, why it is, I think, is because of all the work with meditation. I don't know. Maybe I'm numb, and I don't know that either. So first awareness is being personally aware, physical feelings about, as I said yesterday, about those physical sensations being locked up in the jar, put up on the shelf. You got to remember to go to the shelf and take the jar down, right? It's all squirmy and wiggly in there. Open up the top and look in. They're not going to kill you, I promise. 
In order to figure out what is happening, listen and be curious without making meaning. It's, if you make meaning, it means you've left your feelings and your physical sensations. You've gone back up into that little addict and you're limiting yourself to one or two thoughts. It could be something totally different. Show themselves in specific sensations. What are the needs? Trust yourself. It all comes down to trusting yourself. Fortunately, being curious and trusting helps us find ways to calm ourselves. In order to be able to write with myself, I need to explore and release those feelings, clarify what it is that I do want, and verbalize it. What to watch for with clues are sensations, lapses in memories, distractibility, pitch of voice going up or being too strong. Distractibility is a big one for me, or lapses of memory. Some of it's my age, but some of it's also stress. It's just pure stress. And so I really encourage people to, when they're driving, turn off the radio. Really focus on driving, because you don't want to add that to it. Um, clarifying personal trauma impacts our ability to trust and share with others. Interventions. I know I had a time limit. I'm just about done. Okay, you know what I'm going to do is um, maturity is reaching out. Any talk of suicide, any thoughts of suicide, please reach out to a professional. And um, I would like to do the activity. So when what you want to do with this activity, whether you finish it here today or not, is these, these lines, the straight lines, are they make up what they call vectors. They're like pieces of pie. And so I gave you a list of different kinds of friends, recreation, spiritual work. What you do is you name each piece of pie. So one piece would be um, church. And I would like list, I've got Sally, and I've got Jack, and I've got Henry, and I would list those names, and I would go, and I've got me, written me at the center. I don't know if I have a picture of this. I don't. Thank you. So what you're doing, if you have volunteer work, then um, you list like one or two people. What, what your outcome goal is, is to go down to that me section that's got these circles going around it. And let's say I'm particularly comfortable with Sally from church. Then I would put her at the second circle out from me. And let's say in volunteer work, I would put down Henry as he's the third circle out. He's not that, he's close, I can tell him good things, but he, I don't feel really comfortable talking about my inside stuff. Let's say it's a person from um, my volunteer work. That person may be on the next line outside of me. So I go all the way around and all I'm doing is putting dots around each section. When I finish that, then I take it's playing dot to dot. Then I'm looking at the connecting the dots around the circle. So for example, you might have a dot that's on the fifth circle out, like my neighbors, right? So it would go like this, and so it'll look like a star. That tells me, oh, I kind of need to develop more deeper relationships with my neighbors if I want them to be there. Um, I am particularly close to my volunteer friends or my church friends. It helps us see where the gaps are and it gives us a pictorial image to know who's there in our tribe. So our friends are there, so I'm finishing it up. Our friends are there for support to help us see ourselves, to help us feel buffered from some of the outside stuff that's coming our way. And are there any questions? So at, the oh, hey. <laughs> at this point, we can take questions if anybody has any. Suzanne, are there any online? There Not yet, okay. If anybody has any comments, I can come around, pass the mic, and you guys can ask Ann some questions directly. Pie. 
Thank you. And let's say you've got four friends under volunteers. And let's say that uh, you've got three friends under neighbors, two good friends that are close to you under another, whether it's hunting or gardening or whatever. You're putting dots to how close they really are to you. So I know Sharon, if you don't mind me pulling you out here, I know Sharon, we, Sharon and I have a unique relationship because we're acquaintances, we've seen each other through the years, but I would put Sharon in this next circle next to me because I know that Sharon would get it of what I'm trying to talk about to her and that I wouldn't have, and in everyday life, I wouldn't think about, sorry Sharon, I wouldn't think about letting you know about what my neighbors just did, right? So it's, what it's doing is it's helping us figure out how to see who's really close in our tribe, who we want to trust that will really be there when the days get darker, if they get darker, and who I don't. So I have a lifelong friend who I will never call her to show up because she doesn't know how to show up. And as much as she loves me, now we're talking... Okay, I'm 60, so she's been in my life 53 years. So she's known me in and out, but I will not call her because in the past, she hasn't been there when the days were dark as much as she would like to be there. She doesn't have the ability to be there. So why would I set myself up? Does that help at all? Yes. Okay. And then, uh, so yeah, this is my inner circle and it goes out. Like yeah, that. it looks like a star. So when your world is that small, I can't think of other categories. <laughs> right. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Okay, so what, what we saw here is that she's got several categories of choice that in the future she may choose. She might choose to join a bridge club. Right. Let's just say you play bridge. And because you want to have more of a support system in your life. This is what puts us in control of a very uncontrollable train. I want to know that I'm really doing my best to support myself and my family with the, the opportunities that I have in front of me. I will tell you, um, it's been an interesting dance in the last few years. You know, I'm, I've told you folks, I'm in the waiting room now to, to assess. And so I started a program in our community, and I finally had to fess up. These people don't know I'm sick. And I said, okay, here's the drill. I'm getting this program started, and I will ascertain who can take the reins if they need to be given up. But I'm sorry I misled you. But I wanted the, this community to have this program. And they got right behind me and said, yes. So we have choices, yes. Any other comments? Was that helpful? Yes. I was just going to mention about, sorry. You were talking about water and how that grounds you. Yes. You also can't cry and drink water at the same time. Oh. You learned that at a funeral. But you can choke. You can <laughs> choke. You just take small sips. And the other thing with um, Caring Bridge, I used it for my mother when she was in hospice to report because I couldn't handle all the calls were coming in from all the relatives. So if I did a daily thing, yeah. that we used that more. My sister with her friend who eventually passed from breast cancer, they did a uh, ride chart. So somebody different every day would take her to treatment because she okay. was, yeah, you don't want to pick on the same people all the time, you will wear them out. The other thing that um, another friend ran into on Caring Bridge is when the news is great, her humor is awesome, but there has not been any charting for about three months because it's not good. So plan to get a backup person who's willing to write and just say the journey's tough. Pardon me? My family wasn't oh. able to, able to? I suppose able.
Okay, we have another one right over here. So this is just a comment on Caring Bridge. So I, I've not used it for all the things you talked about, the food, um, the going to appointments, because usually my appointments are a week in Philadelphia. So it's hard to like have people just sign up for that. They're not just driving me somewhere in the city. Um, so what I use it for is to personally journal. And then I put it out there. And my humor remains the same, whether it's, I got METS to the spine, or whether I have METS to the brain, or whether I have METS to the liver. It's, it's always, you know, I always try to put not only the cancer stuff, but it's a way for me to organize my thoughts. Go to a doctor's appointment and then reiterate what I've heard, what I think, what I know, and what's gonna happen next. Um, like I just looked on it, my last one was the spinal mets, and I actually have a picture of where you can see it, you know, so that people know where it is in my spine. Because I'm like, what's your lumbar spine? I don't know. Well, now I do. I know where L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5 is, and where the nodules are, and the treatment that I had. Um, but I also put things like living my best life, like when we went um, whitewater rafting. I have that story. Um, I had three face masks made for all the radiation I had to my brain and my spine, and um, I did Halloween decorations with that. I haven't posted that one yet, but I want to. So it's not only journaling about the cancer, it's journaling about my life. And when people send me a text and they say, well, how's it going? I'm like, have you read my Caring Bridge? Um, although I don't post that often because it, it's, it's work, because it is journaling. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much, Anne, for being here and taking time to talk to all of our patients today and connections. Connections are so important, whether there are personal connections or external connections. And this is a community that only this community knows about. You know, there's times where I always say in my own personal journey, the family that I thought I had wasn't the family that I got, you know? And so you have to be able to to be able to cope with that and do that, and writing is a huge source for that for myself. Um, so whatever you can find peace, because this takes so much peace away, you've gotta be able to put it back in the peace bucket, you know? So thank you.